I'm an ICU nurse and I help all these people and I could have saved my own family. And I just hope he knows how much he meant to everybody and how much he meant to our kiddos. Jason Engler was only 38 years old when he died from COVID-19. He found out, I believe it was November 5th, and then by November 8th, he had passed away. So it was a huge shock to everyone, obviously being younger. His father hadn't heard from him in a couple days and went to go look for him and went to his house and found, as the one that found him. So a crushing tragedy to that entire school district. The Belmont Clemmy School District um, is where Jason taught math and science to the gifted program. He was beloved and truly a joy to be around according to all the other teachers. I think the hardest part is the guilt because he was new to our district. You go into a staff meeting on a Monday morning and you're given 15 minutes to find out your coworker has passed and then you're expected to cope with your own emotions and then go in and help your kids. The kindergarten teacher, Marnie Markward, decided, you know, that wasn't enough. She said they were all walking around like zombies and just in complete and utter grief and shock and she felt like she needed to do something, they needed to do something. I think for Marnie and all of the teachers, there was no outlet, there was no way to grieve. They couldn't hug each other, they couldn't gather, they couldn't talk together about it. And it was such a loss so quickly. So there was no processing this. There was just so much grief and they didn't know how to process it and how to deal with it. And they thought, what is a way we can honor him and keep his name and his legacy going because teachers, as we all know, are so important. And that's what he loved. They thought Jason being a teacher and putting himself through college, not coming from a wealthy family, he worked really hard to become a teacher and they thought a scholarship fund would be the best way to honor him. So they started raising money in all kinds of different ways. Parents donated, businesses donated. It just, it kind of snowballed. They wore t-shirts, they had the students collect loose change. They had all kinds of small things that added up and they ended up raising more than $10,000. Marnie called Jason's family and said, look, we wanna do this you know, in his honor. And his dad said, well, let us give some money too. Oh, I really appreciate it. I really don't wanna take their money. But then I think it's probably part of their healing process too. They asked Jason's dad, what criteria would you like to see in this scholarship? And he said, I would like it to go to someone who wants to be a teacher like Jason. I just hope he knows how much he meant to everybody and how much he meant to our kiddos. Jason's story is like many others. It's incredibly sad. We've lost teachers, we've lost nurses, we've lost so many community members. And I think it's just important to remember that as we continue to fight this, as we continue to deal with this, those are the stories that are important and show just how tragic this pandemic has been. I called him a couple days after his son passed and the superintendent had kind of warned me, you know, he's, he's really suffering and he's really having a hard time and I picked up the phone and I'm like I do not want to have to call this father who just lost his son and right away on the phone he was talking to me through tears and it was so hard and but even within a minute or two he sort of got happier and almost like you could tell he was smiling on the phone and he said thank you for putting Jason's story out there. Thank you for, you know, showing people that his life mattered and that he's not just a statistic. So I think I would really just want people to remember that these are people's lives and they matter and their stories matter. My father was dancing uh, 
two days before he was sick. He, he was fine. And I saw COVID rip the life from their body. Lizanne and Dennis met a little bit later in life and he adopted her son. And that was something Braden said. He said, most people aren't lucky enough to get to choose their dad and I got to choose mine. And I couldn't have made a better choice. He was kind, he was compassionate. There's some glowing going on. He would do 50 push-ups and then take two more steps and do 50 more push-ups. He was very silly, very full of life, loved to dance. <laughs> Linda loved her church. She loved her friends. She loved to text. She lived on her own, took care of herself. She still was driving, that sort of thing. I mean, still very much full of life. She did all her own. Shopping. Everything. She was very bubbly. She, she loved people. My grandmother was fine. Back in October, we had a devastating historic ice storm here in the Oklahoma City metro. And because of that, hundreds of thousands of people lost power. People were moving in with relatives. If you have power, I'll come stay with you, that sort of thing. So Lizanne, the ICU nurse, her mom came to live with the family. And that's where all of this kind of started, unfortunately. I said, babe, are you okay? And he was like, I can't catch my breath. He's like, I don't know, I just feel kind of funny. And he's never, ever sick. And then my mom's like, you know, I don't feel very good. Things just rapidly went downhill for both. She was smart about it. She isolated them in different areas of the house and she really monitored them like she would her own patients. They had a pulse ox, they were taking their temperatures every day and there was kind of a group chat where she would say, okay, I need your numbers. I need the, I need the latest. At five o'clock in the afternoon, he texts me that his oxygen was 95. You know, my mom's texting the same temp, temp. They're taking Tylenol and ibuprofen. And Dennis, her husband, who was in his 50s, who was very healthy, I mean, an athlete, marathon, push-ups every day, athletic guy, his condition declined really the fastest. I put the pulse ox on, his oxygen was 72. He was hypoxic at that point, which means his brain was going without oxygen. Now, meanwhile, I'm thinking my mom has a breathing machine and oxygen in her room, but you can't take it from one and give it to the other. That's when she realized, okay, we have no, there's no other way I can take care of you here. So she called 911. Dennis went to the hospital and then it wasn't a day or two later that, that Lizanne's mom started rapidly deteriorating. I laid on on the floor of her room, listening to her die. One of the most heartbreaking moments of that interview is Linda turned to her daughter and said, if it's okay with you, I just wanna die here if I'm gonna die. I said, mom, it's okay if you die in my house. I just can't help you anymore. I mean, can you imagine having a conversation like that with your mom? And Lizanne said, it's okay if you wanna die in my house, you can die in my house. The next morning came around and there was a conversation that Lizanne, of course, never wanted to have. So I don't have her anything at the house, you know, to ease, to ease her pain. Normal's like 98 to 100. And so for the second time in just a couple of days, the ambulance and the fire truck showed up at that same house and took Linda away. Lizanne was able to, as an ICU nurse, she was able to don PPE, go in and be with her mom as she died, which Lizanne even said was a beautiful gift that most families are not getting right now. Most people are in there dying by themselves. She said, Lizanne, you've been the best daughter. She said, look at me, no regrets. I just wanted to hold her while she was dying and I couldn't, you know? After she passed, I, I gave her a bath and I took all the leaves off of her and fixed her hair. My mother's strength and courage let my grandmother go out with dignity and grace. But one of Linda's questions was, how's Dennis? And, sorry, Lizanne said, he's great. He's doing really, really great. He's doing really good. And she said, because I knew if I told her the truth, she would hang on for me and she would wanna be there for me if I told her that Dennis is dying. And so she made the choice to be a little dishonest with her mom to protect her mom. I said, mom, you know, we're gonna be okay. And thank you for, you know, being around for so long. And thank you for being an awesome grandma and an awesome mom. And Linda passed away shortly thereafter. A similar situation happened with Dennis. Dennis asked how Linda was doing. 
she said, mom's great. I think she might live with us. It's okay. We're going to take care of each other. He did not know that her mom had already died, but she said the same thing. Dennis, if he knew that my mom was not going to be here to comfort me, he would have fought. Dennis was on his stomach, as we see a lot of these COVID patients kind of in their, in their final fight. And she was rubbing his back and talking to him. He was very, very sedated. To be comfortable was very sedated. I laid with him in the bed and I said, you know, I'm here. I love you. You remember our talks, right? You know, and he said, uh-huh. And I said, I'm going to let you go now, okay? And he said, uh-huh. And I said, you're going you're gonna to be in peace. And he said he loved me. I cleaned him up and I put clothes on him and I cut his hair. And, and then I left him. I think full of life is a great way to describe both of them. And Braden, when he said neither of them a week before this happened were prepared to die, but he said COVID was so painful and so relentless that they were both willing to, to be done in the end. And she, in my opinion, very bravely and very transparently sent some very intimate photos of his final moments. And she wanted me to share them. She wanted people to know that this is what COVID looks like. This is real. This is what it does to my family. A week before this, he was doing push-ups and dancing. Very stats, you know, that they use to make themselves feel better and justify why they're not gonna wear a mask. But that doesn't account for what they did in my family because it took 40%. It's a 40% of our tiny, we just have such a small family. She had gone down to Texas to take care of these very sick people. She saw body bags being loaded into the back of trucks. And she said, I came back and told my family, this is serious. We have to take this seriously. And they did. And it still got into their home. Wear your mask. Wear your mask and, and know this is real. I wear one to take care of your family. All they had to do was wear one when they were around my family. I'm an ICU nurse and I help all these people and I couldn't save my own family. As a journalist, try to remain as neutral as possible. However, especially throughout this pandemic and through a couple of other tragedies that we've covered here in Oklahoma, I realize that we are still humans first, journalists second. After that interview, I was so remarkably upset. I told my husband, I said, I cannot imagine losing you and my mom within a week. And I thought, does this make me a bad journalist that I'm not able to separate my feelings from this story? And I wrestled with that for a while. And I think the short answer is no. I think it makes a great journalist to be able to tell stories that emotionally hit all of us I think telling stories and connecting with people, sharing their emotion, grieving with them if it's appropriate, it makes a good journalist. It was one of the top three most horrendous stories I've ever told. And I've been doing this for more than a decade. It stuck with me. I had dreams about this family. I still talk to them. I try to check in with them as much as I can. It'll stick with me for the rest of my life.